And welcome back to this week's episode of Science in the Age of COVID-19. Today, we are happy to welcome two excellent guests. First up, we will have David Baker, a uh, Howard Hughes investigator and professor at the University of Washington. David, of course, many of you are familiar with, um, essentially invented uh, modern computational protein design. Uh, second, we will have Neil King, a, an assistant professor at the Institute of Protein Design at the Uni University of Washington. Neil has worked on a number of projects in his lab, most recently on uh, de novo designed nanoparticles. In Neil's lab, he uses them mainly for drug delivery and as scaffolds for vaccine candidates. Um, the work, uh, some of the work that he will speak about today. Um, we have used these in our lab as um, contrast labels for electron microscopy, and they are working pretty well. Um, it is also noteworthy that Neil is unafraid to get his hands dirty. In addition to the design work, he has recently published a preprint on a lentiviral strain pseudotype with the spike protein of SARS-2. So today they will tell us about uh, their recent efforts working on SARS-2 and will tell us about uh, candidates they have for diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. So uh, first up is David and take it away. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's um, I, you know, I, I was at Janelia just not too long ago giving a talk. And so um, this talk's really gonna be quite different. Um, uh, and I really wanted to focus on um, how, how basic science research has led, has sort of put us in this position of being able to rapidly, um, you know, try and do something uh, as, as are, you know, many people um, regards to COVID-19. and. Um, so I, you know, I became a, an HHMI investigator a long time ago, and at that time, you know, I really had no dream that, no idea that that what I was working on would would ever sort of become uh, become really become useful in 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 in, in any anything, you know, in the, in the immediate future. And so I think in this talk, at the beginning of the talk, I just sort of wanted to reflect on kind of how it happened that we're trying to answer these basic questions and how this got us into a situation where where hopefully we'll be able to do something useful. Um, so, uh, just to sort of reiterate the, the basic concept of, of, of de novo protein design, it's based on the concept that the folded states of proteins are likely global free energy minima for their sequences. So, in um, the, the, the problem which um, uh, you're probably more familiar with thinking about is the protein folding problem or protein structure prediction uh, problem in which uh, you have an um, uh, uh, energy landscape. So, it, can you see my, uh, my, mount, my cursor? Yes. Okay, cool. So you have, uh, so this axis is energy. You have some, some landscape. Each, each point along this landscape corresponds to a different protein conformation. And in the protein folding or protein structure prediction problem, you're trying to find the conformation for which the, the sequence that you are given has the lowest energy. And that's going to be the, 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 the final folded state. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today instead is the design problem where we want to make a new structure and we have to find a sequence whose lowest energy state is that structure. And over the years, uh, we have uh, been, um, as we have learned more and more about protein folding and protein structure, we've been developing a program called Rosetta, where we, which encodes this uh, energy function. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, and methods for sampling through the very large sequence and structure spaces. Um, and uh, the, um, the thing that makes this exciting is there really a huge number of possible proteins. So in biology, which is shown in the uh, upper row here, you have genes in our genomes, which encode amino acid sequences, which fold up into folded proteins. And they have names we know and love. Some of them we don't love, but we know at least. And um, the point is that this is just really a tiny, tiny fraction of what's possible because uh, the sequence space uh, available, the sequence space is so big. Is there's, you know, even with just natural amino acids, 20 amino acids each position, you multiply it out 100 times or 200 times, you get a really astronomical number. And so, um, again, we start by um, uh, the way we explore the space is we make up structures on the computer that um, we think are, are new, interesting, or useful. We work backwards to find an amino acid sequences whose lowest energy states are these structures. And then we obtain synthetic genes which encode these proteins. 
Um, so I, as I was sort of thinking about this talk, um, I, I just wanted to list sort of, I, I won't really go through this in detail, but what, what were the questions that sort of we had to answer um, uh, to get to where we are now? Um, and these are all kind of basic questions, like how do you accurately compute energies within and between macromolecules? Um, you know, what's, should be, what's the correct functional form of an energy function that describes in these interactions accurately? How do you estimate the values of the thousands of parameters? How do you model water? And have, there's some sort of, sort of algorithmic problems. How do you actually sample through the vast number, number of possible sequences and structures? And then if you're building up completely new proteins from scratch, how do you build up things that are actually designable that is for which there exists a sequence whose lowest energy state is that structure. And if you, wanted, if you want to um, design proteins to bind to other proteins, how, how do you actually design interaction surfaces that are gonna be high affinity, geometri geometrically precise, and high, and, uh, and high specificity, um, which is really what you want in, a, in something, for example, to target uh, COVID. Um, and uh, Neil will talk about the problem, how do, you, how do you design interfaces between proteins that direct the assembly of, of symmetric architectures? And then, Finally, um, how do you design switchable systems with two discrete low free energy states? And at, over the years, as we've uh, attempted to address these questions, we started, we, we always start by studying naturally occurring systems and, uh, and then trying to sort of extract principles from what we observe in nature. And then we uh, encode those principles in, in, in design approaches and, um, and then, then make molecules, um, uh, encode, you know, encode them in synthetic genes and, um, and then experimentally test them. So this is just sort of a, a subset of the, the various sort of kind of basic questions we've had to, we've, we've been sort of working towards answering over the years. So I'll just give you one, one very, uh, uh, one, one, a little bit of a, uh, an example with the energy function. And this is really uh, been pioneered in recent years by uh, my colleague, uh, Frank DeMaio at the, um, at the Institute for Protein Design. And so there, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of parameters in an energy function. For example, if you think about a Leonard-Jones potential or electric or electrostatic interactions, there's we, we don't really know what the effects of water are, so we don't really know exactly what the what the values of these parameters should be. And and our approach has been really Frank's approach has been to try and obtain these parameters, and there's thousands of them by fitting against all available data. So from small molecule. Uh, thermodynamic data, we know about the, the density of liquids, we know about the heat of vaporization, we know about transfer-free energies. Then from the protein structure data bank, we have a lot of information. So the, the challenge has really been, and, 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 and Frank has more recently been using small molecule crystal data. So the challenge has really been to, um, uh, to sort of accumulate all, to, uh, as much data as possible and then to uh, parameterize an energy, the energy function against that. I just wanted to give one example, and this is, um, uh, uh, from my colleague, uh, developed my colleague Phil Bradley, who's at uh, Fred Hutch, who's also part of the Institute for Protein Design. And so, so the question is how to treat water and um, the fact that um, uh, if you place, so this is a polar group, obviously, uh, um, an amino group coming off the backbone, and there's an amide. Um, and so if you put, if you put, um, if you block the positions where water would be hydrogen bonding, that should be energetically unfavorable. So previous models sort of had sort of been isotropic. So you get a penalty for placing atoms where anywhere around here. But what Phil developed was a model where you get specific penalties for desolvating in ways, if you place an atom here, then you, um, uh, you can't make interactions. I should say that, that one of the challenges with everything we do, it's um, the calculations are too, um, uh, we're trying to, we need to do too much sampling to enable explicit water models. So we have to treat the, the, the solvent as a continuum, continuum or, um, implicit model. And that's why we need really accurate ways of describing the cost of, of desolvation. And, and the point of this is just that there's a number of different parameters that enter in here in terms of deciding what, of, of describing the orientation dependence and the strength of this desolvation effect. And those are the sorts of parameters that have been um, fit in the way that I described on the previous slide. Okay, so I was at uh, Genelia in, Jan in February, I believe, and I talked about um, a lot of topics and um, sort of gave you sort of an overview of what uh, what computational protein, what de novo protein design uh, can currently do. And I'm um, not going to be talking about any of this today because you you heard me talk about this not very long ago. But the um, the, the upshot of it was that we we can now make a really wide range of different types of of structures. Um, and you know it's it's a sort of demonstration that we understand the fundamentals of protein folding and assembly and that we can now build a whole new world of functional proteins. So today's talk is really 
uh, focus on how can we apply those advance, advances to critical immediate problems like COVID. And um, this is sort of a, this is a timeline or an outline. So of course, COVID emerged and was recognized um, in late 2019. The sequence, genome sequence was available in January, if not before. So the first thing we did was to um, uh, uh, could be in, in structural prediction mode to build it the most accurate models we could. And, uh, and then um, uh, since then, we've been using these models and uh, crystal structures, which were determined afterwards uh, to um, uh, try and develop diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. And that's what, that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. So, um, so structure prediction um, is, is getting more and more accurate all the time. We have a, actually an automated method called Robetta that just runs Rosetta. Um, and uh, here's a comparison of the Rosetta prediction to the X-ray structure, which was released um, a, a few weeks later. It's really remarkably fast. And you can see they're, they're, they're very close. This is a relatively easy modeling problem because there's a, there, there, are, there were structures of other coronaviruses. Um, so, okay, so the first thing that I'll talk about is um, uh, rapid, um, uh, rapid diagnostics, and I'm going to primarily be focusing on detecting anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibodies. And the idea is that is to make a luminescent readout, so you could put a, um, a blood sample in and read out almost instantaneously whether antibodies were there. And um, this, is, this is based on um, sort of on advances we've, we've made, uh, really that Scott Boykin made, in being able to design very specific interactions um, within and between proteins uh, through buried uh, uh, hydrogen bond networks. And we were really inspired by this, uh, to this by the example of DNA, which, it, which achieves um, very considerable specificity, as you know, just from uh, buried central hydrogen bond networks between the base pairs. And so uh, we use these, we've been using these buried hydrogen bond networks and proteins to make um, uh, quite a variety of, of different types of systems, uh, which I talked about last time. The one that's relevant today is this uh, switch-like structure where we have a cage that cages a, uh, a latch and there are hydrogen bonds that hold it together. Then we have a key that actually makes better interactions with the cage than, than does a latch, such that when we add the key, uh, the latch is displaced and it, and it binds the target, um, a target. And uh, so in this, in this, as we described it, Originally, it's kind of an actuator. The key is, is uncaging the latch, and so it can bind the target. And this is some experimental data here. So we have the target down on a sensor chip. And as we add in the key, um, if, we, if the key isn't, doesn't, isn't strong enough, then uh, nothing happens. But as we make the key stronger and stronger, we can basically lengthen it and strengthen the interactions for the cage. Basically, it outcompetes the latch for the cage, and we get target binding. And that's what you see here. And you can see it's tunable because we can tune the strength of the key for the cage. Um, and I, I showed you in my talk in, um, uh, in February that we can cage a wide variety of different things. For example, this is collaboration with Hana El Samad. Here we're caging a degron. This is the cage. This is the, 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 that latch. It has a degron in it. And if we add, if we co-express a key that, that opens this particular cage, then the degron pops out and the YFP gets degraded, and that's what's shown here. Uh, but we this this other cage does not get opened by key A, so it doesn't get the RFP doesn't get degraded. Whereas in this case, um, the uh, if we co-express key C, we open uh, this this switch, um, and we degrade YF, RFP. Okay, so so what we realized was that it was we could simply flip this around to turn it to go from being an actuator to a sensor. So in the, what I just described, we have a constant we have a constant key that binds to uh, the, the cage, and that binding uh, leads to a wide range of desired outputs, protein degradation, nuclear export, CAR-T recruitment, and so forth, um, uh, depending on what we've caged in the system. But we can, what we realized is we could inter invert the information flow such that the, the, the variable component was what um, uh, was, what was uh, in a sense, binding, uh, with, with that was the, was the information in. So in this case, this would be the, the compound you want to sense um, now induces binding of a constant um, output key. So, so basically the input is variable. That's the thing you want to sense. And the output is, is now constant. It's the binding of the key to the cage. And so the way we've implemented that is to, uh, here we have that same cage. We have part of luciferase caged here. And we also have a target binding uh, motif here. And um, when, um, when the target's present, basically it binds to this uh, 
it binds to the, um, uh, uh, it pulls open the cage so that it can bind to the, uh, to the epitope that recognize it or the binding motif. And that, that allows the key to come in and the key, when the key comes in, it reconstitutes luciferase. Um, and so in this, in this uh, sort of thermodynamic diagram here, we have the closed state. Uh, if it, it, the, the free energy cost of, of opening this latch and bringing in the key uh, to reconstitute luciferase is very high in the absence of the target, so the thing stays dark. Um, however, in the presence of the target, now the free energy, the, the, the free energy are coupled, so now we get the free energy of target binding too, and we get light emission. Um, and this has turned out to be a very straightforward way of making a, a pretty broad range of different sensors. So here we example, for example, we have protein A uh, caged in the caged in such a system. Protein A binds IgG. So here we have the amount of light output by the system. If we add in IgG, we get this rapid increase. And um, if we can we can modify modulate the dynamic range over which we we detect um, the um, uh, the the thing we're detecting just by changing the amount of the concentration of the sensor components. Um, here's another example with botulinum neurotoxin. We've been making de novo design binders to the, to the botulinum toxin. We have them caged so that when we cage them, the, the binding surface for the toxin is not accessible. So in order for the toxin to bind, this has to open up and we reconstitute luciferase activity here. Um, and now this is in the case of trying to detect an antibody. This is an anti-HPV antibody. Um, and uh, again, we have epitopes for the antibody here such that it can only, um, they're only available in the open state. So we add, when we add the antibody, we get this rapid increase in detection and it's luminescent. So you can, you can read out signal uh, with, um, with an antibody. You can see, you can read out signal to, uh, to um, the limit of detection is, is sub-nanomolar. Um, okay, so we were interested in, I should just say this is, this is work, um, uh, this is really the work of Alfredo uh, Rubio, uh, he's, um, who, who, and NDA has been uh, working with him. Um, so Alfredo, when, when the, you know, a couple months ago, uh, scoured the literature to try and identify uh, immunogenic peptides from uh, SARS-CoV-1, because there wasn't data on SARS-CoV-2, and he identified epitopes with uh, low identity to, uh, which were quite different in common human coronaviruses. Um, and um, he, uh, he basically built these epitopes into that system, into the system I just described, which he developed. And uh, very readily, really in a matter of a couple of weeks, he was able to develop very sensitive sensors. This is for an anti-M protein uh, antibody. Um, so this is the light, light emission um, before, uh, you know, before you add the antibody, and then here's the antibody. Um, and um, uh, so the competition here is something like a lateral flow assay. The advantage here is that it's, that the readout is very, very quick. Um, and um, here's uh, anti-nucleocapside capsid antibody that he similarly caged an epitope for here. And again, you get a very rapid uh, uh, emission of light here. Um, so what Alfredo is working on now is, you know, we're trying to I would say of the things that, that we're going to talk about today, this one's probably the, the furthest from real world application because we're, we're basically trying to figure out where this, where this fits in amidst the, the wide variety of diagnostic devices that are being developed now. And um, also trying to figure out what the format is. So when you get into diagnostics, as, as many of you know, it comes, you know, the question of exactly what the device is becomes very important. So here we have a, a, a luminescent readout. So ideally, we'd have something like a cell phone um, readout. You could imagine a system where, or what we're thinking about is a tube basically that has the sensor components and the substrate in it, and you add the sample and uh, you measure the light output. Oh, I should just say that um, these sensors are, are very specific. So this is, so Alfredo's made eight different um, uh, sensors. For example, this is one, this is for cardiac tropon troponin. This is for HER2, I mentioned. And then here are the two antibody ones, and you can see they're very specific. So in each case, he, he's got these, each line shows a different sensor or one of the sensors, sorry. So this is like the SARS, the, the M protein sensor, and he's adding each of the eight uh, targets. And here you're only getting signal when the, uh, when the M protein uh, antibody is added. So these sensors are really easy to construct and um, they're very specific. Um, so we're also imagining 
sort of so we're managing sort of point of care applications as well as sort of more conventional uh, multiplex hospital ones where you could have these sensors which are really easy to make against a wide wide variety of clinically relevant targets and then you'd put a little sample you know you'd put your sample into each one and uh, and then read out uh, what you had okay so that's diagnostics um, uh, uh, the second thing that um, we're, you're going to hear about today I'm, we're telling you about today is about sort of more, more uh, is about therapeutics proteins that would actually bind to um, bind to the spike uh, in this case and uh, prevent infection um, and so here's the structure of ace2 binding to the spike and what we're going to do is be doing is design dining small proteins that that compete with uh, ace2 for binding um, so the basic this is one of those basic questions how I brought up earlier how do you design high affinity and specificity binders to any desired target surface and um, we've been, again, working on this over the years. And the approach that I'm going to describe today, uh, we, we, we take advantage of the fact that we can now design literally millions of small proteins on the computer that um, are likely to fold as designed. Um, and then we essentially dock each of these against the target surface of interest. So that's sort of outlined here. So given a target, we identify, so protein of known structure, we identify a region we want to bind to, we design we have this very, very large virtual library of scaffolds. Uh, we dock these against uh, the, the target, to basically find uh, geometrically complementary ways of positioning the, the, the scaffold against the target. And then we design the sequence um, uh, against, um, uh, we design the sequence such that to, to, to drive folding of the protein in the shape we want and have uh, make, make high affinity interactions with the target. And this is work of Brian, Brian Coventry and Long Jin Kao and uh, Long Jing Kao has done essentially all the work on um, Kava 2. I'll tell you about in just a moment. I think he's, he's basically, I'm not sure he has left actually the lab in the last two months. It's really kind of amazing. Um, so what we had done before um, is uh, design binders against, and this is really what sort of the backdrop for what I'm gonna tell you about today. So this is the influenza hemagglutinin, and this is um, a design binding protein, which, is bind, which binds to it uh, 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 quite tightly, and um, this is a superposition of the crystal structure of the design on the design model. Uh, this is solved by uh, Ian Wilson's group. Um, you see it's binding very, very close um, uh, to the design model. And this is, I mentioned the botulinum sensor earlier. Uh, this is the botulinum binder that we designed in structure in complex with the, um, uh, the botulinum, botulinum target. And, and these have some very nice properties. They tend to be absolutely resistant to heat treatment. Um, and uh, they neutralize, um, th and they, we found uh, the, the flu ones to neutralize virus both um, uh, in vitro and then to be protective in vivo. So, uh, so basically, we, we um, uh, Long Jin uh, uh, really doubled double down on making uh, uh, binders to the, the spike protein. Um, and uh, we thought the reasons to do this, there would be several reasons to do this. As I mentioned, they're really stable. These small proteins you make in really large amounts, and compared to antibodies, which are really sort of the, I would say the the industry standard now for protein therapeutic inhibitor. And as you know, there are many monoclonal antibodies that now now are being developed. The density of binding sites is is on a per mass base basis is much higher. So an antibody, you know, 150 kilodalton antibody will have two binding sites, uh, in um, have one binding site every 75 kilodalton. These small ones, the small proteins are about 55 amino acids or seven kilodaltons. And what we can do is design many different ones that bind to the spike protein in different ways and hopefully uh, uh, minimize the chance of escape. And these are, this just shows you, uh, this region here is, is the part that's binding the uh, ACE2 receptor. And so you can see we've got the diff different little proteins bound there. Um, so uh, Long Jin has a whole series of binders now. Uh, this is data on one of his um, better ones. And so this is, uh, this is basically, these, this is just um, bilayer interferometry showing um, this at different concentrations. So the protein, the, the binding affinity we estimate is around 300 picomolar uh, for this design to the uh, RBD. And um, uh, this is just a competition assay with, uh, with ACE2. You add, um, this is ACE2 binding to the, um, uh, to the, uh, um, sorry, ACE2 is on the, on the tip of the sensor. The RBD is in solution, and as you add the, the binder in, uh, you, you completely block binding. Um, and we're also incorporating this binder into the luciferase sensor I just descri I described in the previous section uh, to be able to detect virus directly. 
Um, and on an earlier version, uh, with collaboration with Brett and Brett Case and Mike Diamond, uh, we found that, uh, well, they found that these binders um, uh, 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 neutralize uh, live virus infection of, of, in this case, barely six cells. Um, so we can make that. This is now. That's what we've done, and sort of what we've just ordered now are um, are these sorts of constructs here. We now have multiple different binding domains, and so um, we're thinking about sort of two different uh, routes. One is a nasal route, where basically the idea is the the, the virus um, you know replicates in the nose for 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 some time. So we can make these daisy chained versions, which um, uh, display multiple copies uh, all together, and we expect to get very high avidity. For the virus, we so can bind to multiple spike proteins, and multi at each each spike protein can, in principle, uh, bind three of these. We're also making oligomeric versions, and then finally for um, uh, for systemic administration, right? The most obvious ones are FC fusions, where again, this will give us the long half life, and we we are appending multiple different binding domains. Um, and you know, so we'll this we can also make pegylated versions, of course. Um, so we're just making these constructs now, and uh, we should see in the next uh, few weeks, you know, whether we, we hope to be more, more potent than the best of the monoclonal antibodies, but we don't have data on that now. The reason we, we hope to be is each individual domain is um, uh, binds very tightly. And for example, in this oligomeric sort of fanciful oligomeric uh, structure we've ordered, uh, we have eight, eight chains and each chain has four of these uh, binding domains. Um, so it's, you could think of these as sort of like IgMs on steroids. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Neil. So Neil, I'll just uh, advance the slides. Um, uh, I think I, if I get off, just tell me. Okay, thanks. Hello. So so uh, now I'll, I'll I'll tell you about some of the work we've been doing uh, towards developing vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. And again, it's it's a similar story to what David just described, where you know we had done this this basic research, just asking very simple questions about you know protein structure and energetics and design. And then that led to new technologies that, that we're now able to apply to hopefully help out uh, in the current situation. So on the next slide, um, really what this was at the beginning was a, a, a question of self-assembly, right? And, and the fundamental feature of a self-assembling system is that the information that drives organization is encoded in the building blocks. And the classical example now, of course, is, is DNA nanotechnology. So you can make anything you want any arbitrary nanoscale object out of DNA, smiley faces, right, typographical uh, blocks, anything. And on the next slide, we, we see why this is the case. Uh, the key is that DNA has two fundamental properties that enable this. One is hybridization or Watson-Crick base pairing, which enables you to encode an arbitrarily large number of highly specific interactions. So it's very, very easy to tell the blue strand to interact with the red strand. And then the second feature is the, the existence of stable and predictable structural motifs, such as the double helix, and then beyond that, you know, the double crossover motif and other gridiron motifs, and, and there's a wide range of these now. And if we go to the next slide, what we can see is that, you know, proteins are not as regular as, or, or as stereotyped as, as DNA. Protein, every protein is a unique and beautiful snowflake, and this complexity and irregularity makes, makes designing them much more difficult. Right? And so at the time that, that I joined David's lab as a postdoc, you know, people had tried previous methods for designing new self-assembling proteins, but all of them you know, had some kind of specific niche or, or were limited in some way. There was no general method uh, that could be applied to the design of many different types of self-assembling proteins. And so of course, on the next slide, what we tried to do was, was use uh, pre-existing code in Rosetta, right? So, so all of these features on this slide and many others were already encoded in the Rosetta software. And what we did was we just combined two of those, protein-protein interface design, like Longshing and Brian's work that David just described, and the ability to model symmetric complexes. And we put these two things together to develop this general computational method. And that's graphically depicted on the next slide. And it's, it's two fundamental steps, one step relating to each of those, those um, abilities that we saw in the last slide. So the first step is docking, where we figure out how the protein building blocks fit together in three dimensions. And then the second step is design, where we, we make up new interfaces between those building blocks. So one other feature that's worth pointing out here is that the way that we, we design these things is, is basically the same way that natural self-assembling proteins 
come to be, right? It's, it's, it's a combination of symmetry, mathematical symmetry, and non-covalent protein-protein interactions. If you think about a microtubule, right? Helical symmetry. If you think about a virus capsid, often icosahedral symmetry. And so we're building these things the same way. And that should mean that, that once we get good enough at this, we should be able to match the variety of structures, macromolecular self-assembling structures, that, or, or even exceed that we see in nature. We're still working towards that, of course. <laughs> we're not there yet. Um, so on the next slide is an example of, of the types of materials that, that we make here. Um, this was the work of, of a grad student in David's lab that I worked very closely with, Jacob Bale, um, who designed uh, what we call two components. So they're constructed from two different protein subunits, either a blue and a gray protein or, or an orange and a gray protein on this slide. Two component, 120 subunit assemblies. So these things are about the size of an AAV or, or the smallest of viruses. Um, you know, about 25 nanometers in diameter. And uh, when we crystallize a few of these, we found that they were designed again with, with atomic level accuracy, which is kind of really the bread and butter of, of Rosetta. So we're able to predictively uh, make up these new nanomaterial structures. And on the next slide, you know, you can see that just a, a tiny, tiny, tiny sampling of the, of the variety that this enables, right? So for example, if you wanted for some reason to design a highly porous structure, you would go for the blue and the orange architecture on the left. If you wanted to design a less porous structure, you would go for the blue and the gray architecture on the right. And then even within those different architectures, right, each one of these, these nanomaterials has a unique structure, you know, unique placements of functional groups, uh, everyone is, is, is different and being able to predictively design them means that we should be able to customize the structures that we design for specific applications. So one of the applications that my group has been pursuing uh, quite a lot over the last few years is structure-based vaccine design. And on the next slide, we can see kind of the rationale for this. So um, it's been known forever, if we look at the top left part of this slide, that that um, particulate or repetitive antigens uh, induce a stronger immune response. And there are multiple reasons for this. One of them is, is that the repetitive uh, display of these antigens cross-links B cell receptors on the surface of the B cell that drives stronger signaling um, and activation of that B cell and, and induces a, a stronger antibody response. On the right side of the slide, this is a different way that, that particulate or repetitive antigens uh, uh, perform better, and that's by trafficking uh, to the lymph nodes very, very efficiently. So they kind of get where they need to go uh, more efficiently as well. So on the next slide, um, this is an example of the type of, of protein-based nanoparticle immunogen that, that, that we've been working on. This is an example from RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, um, which if anyone's a parent, you've probably heard of it because uh, pretty much every, uh, every baby on earth gets infected with this virus by age two and it's often really bad. Um, so here uh, we're showing how, how we make these things. So typically what we do is we genetically fuse an antigen of interest in case, in this case, it's this blue protein, this blue trimeric protein called DSCAP1 um, it's a prefusion stabilized variant of the F protein um, that the, the Vaccine Research Center developed several years ago. We genetically fuse the antigen to one of the nanoparticle subunits. In this case, we're, we're fusing the blue trimeric antigen to the gray trimeric nanoparticle components. We're able to match the symmetry uh, because we can design these nanoparticle structures. And then the second component here is this orange pentamer in panel B. And its only purpose is to drive assembly of the nanoparticle vaccine. And so we make these two proteins in, in two different cells, and they can even be different you know, types of cells, mammalian and E. coli, for example. And we purify the two proteins as just standard recombinant biologics. There's nothing special. It's not a particle yet until you mix those two proteins in vitro, and that drives assembly to the, the spiky particle shown in, in panel B. So the, you know, these particles are very monodispersed, very regular, and C is, is some gel filtration data, and D is some light scattering data. In panel E, you can see electron micrographs showing you know, particles where every one pretty much looks like every other one, except for the fact that in this case, the antigen was displayed flexibly, and you can see that when you average the particles. 
And so if we go to the next slide, um, this is this is some functional data from that RSV particle that, that you know shows why uh, this is potentially a good application. The central uh, uh, result on this slide is, is the one shown in panel B, where if we go from the purple circles, that's trimeric DS cap one on its own, so just the blue antigen that we were looking at on the last slide. And when we display that on the nanoparticles, we see this tenfold increase in the neutralizing antibody response, and that. Um, is a very exciting result. It is, it's thought that neutralizing antibodies uh, are what provides protection for RSV. And so this stimulated us to, uh, to advance this particle uh, to the clinic. So on the next slide, um, I'm showing you know, just, just a couple examples and then listing several others of, of different antigens that we've put on this two component nanoparticle platform. And it's not just a single particle, it's, it's many different particles. So the ones that I'm showing on this slide, RSV, influenza, and HIV are all different particles, um, but all of this two component nature. And so, you know, we, over the last few years, I think have convinced ourselves, you know, by putting so many different things on this platform that it really is a robust and versatile platform for multivalent display. And of course, what's relevant now is coronavirus S. And so on the next slide, um, I'm just highlighting the, the people who have been working over the last couple of months to make nanoparticle vaccines for coronavirus here. So it's, it's uh, kind of a skeleton crew from the Institute for Protein Design. Um, and we've been working in very close collaboration with David Wiesler's group here in the, the department um, and his postdoc, Lexi Walls, uh, who's extremely talented. Uh, we've been working in very close collaboration with uh, the Gates Foundation on this. Okay, so on the next slide, uh, I'm just highlighting kind of the classes of, of immunogens that we're designing. So um, on the left are, are just the soluble, what, what I'll refer to as the soluble antigens from, from uh, the coronavirus spike protein. So it's either the monomeric RBD where the protein is in blue and then the two in-linked glycans are shown in green, uh, or on the bottom left, the, the full spike trimer ectodomain. And then on the right, we're going after two different classes of particles, RBD nanoparticles that are just displaying that receptor binding domain uh, at high density, and then spike particles displaying the, the trimeric ectodomain. And so on the next slide, um, I'm just showing a little bit of in vitro data from the, the RBD nanoparticles. Again, you know, we were able to take advantage of this existing two component nanoparticle platform that we had developed to very rapidly generate these particles. They're very monodispersed, very regular. Uh, you can see from the, the EM and the, and the DLS data, uh, they're antigenically intact. So we come in with either the receptor or uh, monoclonal antibodies and, and we can show that the protein is folded correctly when it's displayed on the particle. And on the next slide is similar data for the spike uh, particles, um, where on the left we can see uh, you know, lots and lots of spike particles. The, the, the spike protein is, is enormous. It's over 1200 residues per subunit. And so you can really very clearly see it on the outside of these particles. Um, you know, gels in the middle showing the presence of both components, what we call the A component, which has the antigen attached, and then the B component that drives assembly. Light scattering data, again, looks very monodispersed. And so on the next slide, um, We've been doing immunogenicity studies here in mice um, at the IPD just to gauge whether you know these nanoparticle vaccines are any better than the just the soluble antigen. And so we have a couple different studies going on. In the first one, we're really comparing the RBD nanoparticle vaccines to the soluble antigens, the soluble receptor binding domain and the trimeric spike. Um, and we are measuring out antigen-specific antibody and pseudovirus neutralization here uh, here at UW. Um, and comparing to uh, acute and convalescent human sera, just to kind of benchmark where we are. It's, you know, it's apples to oranges comparing immunized mice to, to infected humans, but just so we know. Um, and then Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina is, is doing live virus neutralization, and, and we're actually going to ship him our mice, and he's going to challenge them with a mouse-adapted virus that he's developed. And so on the next slide um, is some of the data post prime. Um, so this is just after a single immunization. And I think the first thing that you notice is that neither the monomeric RBD nor the trimeric spike at, at the doses that we tried um, elicit detectable antibody responses. 
um, after a single immunization. And in contrast, the RBD nanoparticles, which are shown in kind of the, the purplish and the bluish colors, um, are induced, clearly inducing, you know, detectable levels of, of antigen-specific antibody and neutralizing activity on the right side of the slide in, in the Visser lab pseudovirus neutralization assay. Um, the four samples in red on the right are, are uh, four um, human serum samples that kind of span the range of potency that we've observed by ELISA. So human serum one is the most potent sample we've seen, um, and human serum two is, is the least potent sample that we've seen. And so you can see uh, that while a couple of those um, human serum samples one and five are, are quite potent by total binding antibody titers on the left, in terms of neutralization, the, the RBD nanoparticles are, are actually outperforming them. And again, this is apples to oranges, immunized mice infected humans, but, but just as a benchmark, um, we think that's very encouraging given, given that you know, the doses that we're using here, 0.88 micrograms and five micrograms are, are not considered high doses uh, in a mouse. And so on the next slide where we can see uh, post boost data. So this is after the second immunization. Um, and now uh, what we're seeing are, are really very robust antibody responses from the RBD nanoparticles. And on the left, we can, we can see that the, the monomer, the monomeric RBD and the trimeric spike are starting to induce antigen specific binding antibodies. Uh, when we look at neutralization on the right, the monomer is still not neutralizing the virus. Um, whereas the trimeric spike clearly is, is inducing neutralizing the antibodies after the boost. The RBD nanoparticles are, are substantially higher than the, the trimeric spike in terms of their neutralization capacity, um, including at a about six-fold lower antigen dose, the 0.88 microgram group in blue. And the other thing to note is, of course, that now we're, we're significantly higher in terms of neutralizing activity than the acute and convalescent human sera. One thing that I'll note here is, is, look, this is all happening in real time. This is very, very preliminary data. Um, we actually think that the RBD nanoparticles are underestimated here because we weren't expecting such potent neutralization. And so the, the dilution series that Lexi set up did not get to a non-neutralizing baseline. Um, so we actually think the numbers are probably higher than this. And then on the, the next slide, um, we can see some of the, the live virus neutralization data from Ralph Barrick's lab, which, which exactly mirrors what we saw um, here at UW, which is that the trimeric spike at low dose, and I, I didn't put this data on the last slide, but, but we saw the same thing, uh, was actually non-neutralizing. Um, we were not able to detect neutralizing antibodies. I mean, there's maybe a tiny bit in one of the mice there. Uh, the trimeric spike at high dose is clearly neutralizing in their assay. You know, with live virus, they're seeing a, a neutralization titer of about 10 to the fourth. And then on the right are the, the RBD, one of the, the blue RBD nanoparticle from the last slide um, at low dose and high dose. And you can see that in both cases, it's, it's very potently neutralizing. And at high dose, it, you know, uh, it, in their words, it was, it was off the chart. And it, I mean, it's literally off the chart. Uh, again, their dilution series did not extend far enough um, to really get to a non-neutralizing baseline. So we're very excited about these data. Um, and we are working very hard right now to tech transfer these particles out to a couple different groups um, to manufacture them. And, you know, we are not, the protein-based vaccines are, are absolutely slower to develop than nucleic acid-based vaccines, right? I mean, Moderna and, and others are, are already moving towards phase two. So we are clearly way behind. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, the activity, the neutralizing activity that we're seeing here is very encouraging. And, you know, we don't know which vaccines are going to be safe and effective yet. And uh, we've got to do everything we can to make sure that there is a safe and effective vaccine. And then the, kind of the last thing I'll mention is that um, we know that, that protein-based vaccines like the one uh, I've described here are very scalable in terms of manufacturing. And so you know, we're hoping that even though we're a little bit behind, we might be able to help out um, in the current situation. And so on the last slide, I'm, I'm just highlighting again what, what David spoke about before, and, and he's going to wrap this up again, emphasizing this point. But, you know, I think the, the, the journey that we just went through, even just for the vaccines, right, started with, with, with basic research into, you know, 
how do you design self-assembling proteins? And what, what do natural self-assembling proteins look like? And what principles can we learn from them and, and then apply? And then it really importantly, right, you take those principles and you encode them in software. And that, once you've done that, and once you've done that successfully, that allows you to just use that method again and again and again and again. And, and perhaps even more importantly, you can always build on and extend that method. And, and I, I hope I've shown you that, you know, in this case, it led to the development of a new technology platform uh, that we were able to, to rapidly apply uh, in response to the current pandemic. And, and we're hoping that that can contribute to a real world solution. So I'll stop there and, and, and turn it back over to David. Yeah, so just, just a, a few words. Neil and I are interested not only, of course, in doing something for the current pandemic, but being able to do something to do even better more quickly with, um, in the next one, because this is certainly not the last crisis that we're going to face. And uh, just to continue with the, with the theme of this talk, uh, we can still do considerably better by improving the, um, the fundamentals. So in the protein modeling and just more, and all the design calculations, having more accurate protein, more accurate scientific models um, will definitely help better energy functions. The diagnostics area, we could still be better at designing uh, multi-state proteins with catalytic activity in one of the states. That's the fundamental idea of the sensor. For the therapeutics area, being able to design very high affinity interactions um, uh, right very, very quickly uh, from having um, uh, a structure of the target. It's, it's um, we, you know, Longjin is super quick, but it's still, you know, it took several months. We'd like to ultimately be able to go from a crystal structure to a very, very high affinity uh, potential therapeutic in, in weeks. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Neil's super exciting work on vaccines. Um, uh, there's, there's still more to be learned. Neil didn't really talk about it, but he's also exploring putting co-modulators on the particles to boost responses further. And that, uh, that, you know, more fundamental understanding of the immune response will help there. And then another thing that's coming online that's very exciting is uh, deep learning approaches are starting to inform all of these areas. And that's another very interesting area for exploration. Um, so acknowledgements, um, uh, let's see, the sensor work um, for COVID, really all, almost all the work of Alfredo Rubio on the, on the, um, in the general, he's been facilitated, helped in developing the trans, uh, the platform by Andy Ye. And on the binder side, uh, Long Jin Kao has just done absolutely, is doing heroic work. And uh, he's been helped with uh, by Brian Coventry and uh, Ina, and uh, Neil can acknowledge the vaccine people. Yeah, it's, it's really been a, a team effort here, um, led by Lauren Carter and the IPD Core Labs, but, but everybody has just been diving into this and, and it's been fantastic to see everyone come together. Um, yeah, I think we'd be very happy to take questions. Well, that's great because you've got a ton. <laughs> Um, okay, that was heroic and gives me um, faith that, that... Now, Lauren, I told you it was going to be 47 and a half minutes. <laughs> you, you are exactly right. Wow. I mean, man, gosh, you guys really trained this right to the second. Yeah, we've been working on this for months, like I told you. <laughs> well, it's even more impressive since you put it together so quickly. Um, Okay, so we are gonna dive right into questions. Um, I'm gonna start with one from me. It's on the first part of the talk where you, uh, you said you came up with models for um, all 26 ORFs in the genome. Um, how, how did, do you guys think those are, are reliable because- Oh yeah, sorry. No, we were focusing there on the spike, which was a relatively easy modeling challenge because the, 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 you know, the SARS-1 spike was available. We have built models for, uh, for all of the, you're right, we've built models for all of them. And uh, uh, my colleague, Frank, who I mentioned has been designing, um, been doing uh, sort of virtual um, uh, drug screens against them. Uh, um, and has identified some very interesting hits to already existing compounds. But as you'd expect, the reliability of those models decreases with, uh, you know, with their divergence from other, um, from other proteins of known structure. Yeah. Right. And, and a couple of the most critical ones have, you know, no resemblance to anything yeah. of, of known structure. Um, yeah, and I, so I guess, you know, there have, we and others have made a lot of advances in structure prediction, but you generally need, uh, and you can now generate, uh, you know, produce models that are quite accurate for proteins that don't have any relationship 
the proteins have known structure, but you need a lot of sequences, which you don't really have in this case. So. Right, okay. But hmm, are there ways to, that you could use your, you know, admittedly probably pretty rough models of let's say ORF3A and NSP11, um, yeah, maybe to like um, turbo boost structure determination efforts, if you could design, I don't know, what stabilization Wait. Well, let's see. Yeah, so what we found is that for cryo EM, for if you have moderate resolution cryo EM maps, say at like above four angstrom, so it's hard to trace the density and it's de novo, that, that actually these structure prediction methods uh, can really help. And I actually have been getting emails from people who have been using our, our software for this, which is really great. But I think the models have to be, they, they probably would have to be better. I mean, maybe that, you know, we'd certainly be you know, people, we'd certainly be willing to be very happy to help people solve structures, but I think it's exactly what you say. You'd, the model should really just be viewed as an adjunct to, uh, yeah. to conventional structure determination. Yeah. Um, okay, your, your second question shamelessly also comes from me. Um, and then, then we'll get to other people. Um, so uh, I'm wondering about the modeling how you handled the glycans, um, because spike is is glycosylated. We think at seventeen different positions, yeah. and some of them are critical for binding. And you know, glycans are super floppy and you know poorly parameterized by by most of the force fields. So how do you how do you handle that? Yeah, that's a very good question, and um, we faced that first in um, when we were trying when we we're designing binders to the influenza hemagglutinin because group two hemagglutinins have a lot of glycans in the area. So, uh, as you can imagine, it, what you said is is exactly true that they're very flexible, and and because of that flexibility, are hard to model. So, I would say we have a very sophisticated on the binder side, it's a very very sophisticated approach, which we which is we pr try and stay out of the way. <laughs> I mean, it seems to have gotten the job done. You guys have high affinity binders, so. Yeah, yeah, so we know where they are. Um. And there's a, there's a team of people in the Rosetta community, particularly from Jeff Gray's lab at Johns Hopkins, that's been working on improving glycan modeling. Um, and Bill Sheaf's lab at Scripps has contributed to those efforts as well. Um, and it's, it's getting better, but it, it's still not great. I, I would call it a rough approximation. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard problem, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Next up, we have a question from um, Israel. Um, th so you, you guys showed some um, amazing data for specificity of your binders. Um, it wasn't really clear how many and what um, decoys you were feeding it, but um, have you guys done a more systematic path uh, to look for off-target binding, you know, maybe incubate and pull down or something. Like yeah, so we've done that. Um, let's see, we haven't done that with uh, with uh, RBD binder because it's so new. But in the past, what we've done is sort of, you know, sort of standard proteomics where you pull down, you have your design protein and you have it expressed in cells and you pull down and you see by mass spectrometry what's associated with it. And when we've done that, they've been very specific, pretty much just bound what their target was. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, oh, it wasn't, uh, it, you, you didn't make it completely clear. Um, when, when you model the binders, do you, do you model it in their folded conformation or as an extended peptide? Oh, let's see. Do you mean in the sensor scenario or in the- oh, I would say the sensor. Right, so in the, like in the case of the botulinum toxin binder and the, mo and the things we're now making for for the RBD, we, we model the, the things in its folded state and we, we have the binding surface so that it's, it's up against the, the, the cage. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's see, next up we've got a really good question from Tim Ryan who's on the talk um, about your uh, sensors for uh, antibody presence. So, I mean, you, you guys, um, you know, you, you're probably aware of the, the literature on convalescent plasma yeah. um, for COVID-19. It seems that for whatever reason, a very small fraction, um, probably 3% of the, 
of antibodies that are developed are neutralizing. Um, so have you guys thought about ways to um, tailor it? Can, can you have it look for neutralizing antibodies specifically? Um, t Tim's question uh, e even said it a little more pointedly. He he's worried that you would maybe be, that the sensor might be detecting more non-neutralizing antibodies. And he wants to know, can you tailor, yeah. the, tailor the hydrogen bond network to kind of tune in antibody binding uh, strength? Right, well, there, there, there's, there's sort of a two part answer to that. The first is that the neutralization activity uh, pretty strongly correlates with RBD binding. Um, mm -hmm. And that's very relevant to, uh, to Neil's um, approach, which is you know, why, you know, dis why making nanoparticles which display specifically the RBD is so good at eliciting neutralizing and protective antibodies. And those antibodies, um, since we have these binding domains that bind at the RBD, um, uh, we expect, so the, you know, it's not clear exactly how all these antibodies are binding, but the ones that work by blocking the ACE2 binding site um, we expect we should be able to detect by embedding our binders to that region in the in the um, uh, in the sensor. Now, the the other point though is a very good one. This the sensor works by thermodynamic coupling. So if so, weak binders are hard to detect. We we estimate that the limit of detection is about one tenth the kd of the binding interaction that is the basis for the sensor. So that means if you have a one nanomolar antibody antigen interaction, you can detect that antibody down to 0.1 nanomolar. But if it's 100 nanomolar, you can only go down to 10. So that's, so yeah, so the advantage of the, this approach is you can scan, you can, you can basically make sensors that are crafted to recognize antibodies that bind to different parts. But the limitation is you, it's hard to detect weak interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, um, a related question to that. Um, uh, okay, now, now let's go for an unrelated one. Um, so you showed us the, um, the spike protein-based uh, vaccines. Um, you guys have probably seen uh, some of the papers from SARS-1. Um, one of the big ones was from Ralph's lab that showed that there might be um, serious side effects to using um, uh, spike as the antigen. Um, I, I know of the like 90 odd vaccine platforms, I, I think all but two or, three of, two or three of them are targeting spike, but um, the next best one probably would be nucleocapsid. Um, ha have you guys thought, have you done anything towards going after that one? Not in a vaccine context. So, um, yeah, the, so I think a lot of the, the risk, the potential risk with using the spike, right, is that you get a higher proportion of antibodies that bind but do not neutralize the virus, mm -hmm. right? And that has been shown to be associated with vaccine at, uh, associated enhanced uh, respiratory disease mm -hmm. um, for other diseases, and, and there are signs of that from SARS, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we think, and, and look, we're going to have to test the thing and find out, but we think that that actually may be one of the advantages of our candidate is that we're inducing a very high proportion of neutralizing antibodies relative to total binding antibodies. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and take the ratios of, of the titers and the, and the slides, you can, you can actually see that. And so we think that <clears throat> with that higher quality antibody response, right, and, and the very high neutralizing activity that we're seeing, we're probably going to be able to minimize that risk. But again, I mean, you don't know until, until you go test it. Yeah. Uh, so follow up to that. Um, have you guys, are there any plans maybe with a collaborator to um, actually test the, uh, the generated antibodies for antibody dependent enhancement? Because that is, that is a big feature of coronaviruses. Right, right. So um, I am sure at some point we will do those studies. We haven't started them yet. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, I think, you know, taking, taking vaccine elicited antibodies and then basically uh, diluting them out, right, and, and getting to very low levels where you might see 
ADE and, and things like that is, is probably something that we'll eventually do. And I mean, it's likely to be important for a clinical development program. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up we have a great question from Hong. Um, do the nanoparticles induce an immune response themselves? And if so, is that good or bad? <laughs> yeah, so they, so they do, right? So it's a, it's a foreign protein, it's two foreign proteins that are forming a highly repetitive structure. <laughs> and so yes, you get robust antibody responses against uh, the underlying nanoparticle. Next question, do they matter? We don't really know yet. Um, we've done a couple of experiments, including with Sebastian, who's on the call, um, where we pre-immunized mice with just the nanoparticle, but no displayed antigen to, to generate high anti-scaffold responses. And then we came in and boosted those animals with the antigen displaying particle. And what we saw was no deleterious effect on the antigen specific response. And that's, that was true for binding titers and neutralizing titers. So, you know, in that case, having pre-existing antibodies against the scaffold didn't hurt. You might argue that it could even help by getting immune complex formation, which could traffic things to germinal centers better. Um, but, you know, that's an experiment in a naive mouse. I think we need more data on this point. And honestly, the only thing that's really going to definitively answer this question is multi-year dosing in humans. Yep. Yep. Um... Okay, uh, next up we have a question from Charlotte. So the binders that you guys are developing as potential therapeutics, um, any idea how those would be delivered? Do you think those can just be delivered naked or would you encapsulate those or? Yeah, so that's one of the things we'll have to figure out. And I mentioned two routes of administration. One was nasal, sort of in a perhaps a gel form. And uh, that would be more for, you know, someone going into an area where there might be a lot of virus, like a healthcare uh, professional. Um, and then the other would be systemic, and when that would be IV. Um, so um, in, the, in the IV case, uh, there are basically two possibilities. It would be an FC fusion, like an antibody. And there we'd hope to be better because we could have, like I said, a a larger density of, of binding domains. And the other, other possibility is pegylation. Which, I mean, the problem with the small proteins, the half-life will be really short as a naked protein. In, into the nose, um, uh, there are two possibilities. One is some sort of gel or slow release formulation. The other is to incorporate mucin binding um, uh, domains to, so it just so it basically holds on and doesn't get washed away. But that's all, and those are all things that we're gonna be, we're, we're starting to make now, but we don't have any data on yet. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, next up, we have another question from Charlotte. Um, can you use your nanoparticles to display multivalent vaccines with the goal being, um, you know, maybe you guys could immunize us against COVID-19 and the common cold <laughs> coronaviruses and future ones? Yeah, and it's, it's a great question. Actually, we think this is one of the unique strengths of our platform, actually. So because of the, the ability to assemble these things in vitro from purified subunits, that, that enables the display of multiple different antigens or antigenic variants on the same particle. Um, and we're going to be submitting a, a manuscript on, on flu vaccines where we use that approach tomorrow. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. Uh, and we, we've shown that we can actually get much broader protection against uh, flu using that approach. And so, I mean, look, going after lineage B beta coronaviruses is a very, very obvious thing to do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, let's see. Next up, you have another question from me. So um, you showed a competition of your elicited antibodies against some convalescent plasma isolates. Um, but you know, as we previously discussed, uh, you know, CP is, is pretty, pretty poorly enriched in neutralizing antibodies. So um, have you guys thought about uh, comparing against, I guess, a gold standard, which would be a recombinant antibody from CP? Like, you know, there's about 10 of them published now, 
like 47 G11 is looking really good. Um, they're not giving out the sequence, uh, but you could maybe get an, an aliquot to test. Right, right. Yeah, I know. Nobody's giving out the, the antibody <laughs> sequences. Um, so our collaborator, uh, David Beasley here in the department, just, just published a paper um, with another RBD-directed neutralizing antibody, S309. And so, of course, he has uh, tons of neutralization data on that. And so, yeah, we can make those comparisons directly. I mean, the other thing that we're doing right now is, is you know, competition analysis and immunodepletion analysis and things like that to kind of better understand, you know, which epitopes we're hitting on the RBD, because there are actually multiple neutralizing epitopes on the yeah. RBD, right? So which ones of those are we hitting and, and, and how potently and can we put this, you know, as you're suggesting in like an anagrams per microliter type of scale. Mm -hmm. So we're, yeah, we're doing all that right now. Yeah. Um, I guess segueing, uh, that's a nice segue to the next question. Um, so d do you think that the, the RBD only uh, vaccine scaffold is um, likely to be the, the best way forward? So, um, you know, the, the disadvantage that's immediately going to come to mind, right, is, is the possibility of escape. Right. Are you going to get is the virus going to generate mutants that will escape that? And because you're only hitting, you know, some portion of the spike protein. And I mean, the real answer is we don't know yet. Um, yeah. But, and, you know, we'll just have to see and we'll have to get data on it. But I think there, there are two observations that give me a little bit of comfort there. One is that this this virus doesn't actually mutate at, at a very high rate. Um, this is nothing like flu. Right. Or HIV or anything like that. Um, and then the other is, is again, the, pos or the, the demonstrated existence of multiple different neutralizing epitopes in RBD. And so, I, I, you know, we're, again, getting the data to find out, but I think it's likely that we are hitting multiple independent non-overlapping epitopes mm -hmm. uh, really very potently. And I think that is probably going to help minimize the chances of escape. But that is, you know, the disadvantage, the potential disadvantage of the RBD nanoparticle. Yep. Um, let's see. Next up, we have a question. So for the, the previous vaccine scaffolds that you guys have developed, have you done um, time series to see uh, the, the neutralization potential of, of plasma at various time points after uh, in vaccination? We have, we haven't done what I would call like formal um, durability studies, um, but Sebastian has the best data on this with our RSV particles um, where we, we immunize uh, non-human primates at week zero and four, and then Sebastian followed them out to week 16 uh, before boosting again. And so, you know, that's, yeah, we've got three months after immunization um, and you see, you know, the responses do wane a little bit, as, as you typically see um, from subunit vaccines, but, but we need more data on the actual durability of the responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let's see, you, you guys have mostly uh, covered this about um, by, by targeting multiple regions to prevent escape. Uh, but we've got a, we've got a number of uh, questions about uh, viral mutations. Um, you, you know that this is it's all over the newspapers. The virus, you know, it's even called you know different strains, etc. You know the the scientific consensus is that probably none of them are functional yet, except maybe um, the one on spike uh, D six fourteen G probably increases um, uh, copy number in the throat. Um, but uh, how would you generally speak about uh, the potential of your platform to respond to um, antigenic drift? Yeah, so I think, you know, short term with the, with the RBD nanoparticle, right, we're getting that out and, and we've kind of talked about that. I think Longer term, we are working on, on broader coronavirus vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and we think, you know, we think you can probably do a fair amount with just the RBDs there as, if you use multiple different RBDs. 
Uh, but we are also working on displaying the full link spike ectodomain. I showed some electron micrographs. Mm. Particles look beautiful. You know, we're getting immune responses from them. We think that there may be opportunities there to make broader coronavirus vaccines. And that's something that we're very, that we're, we're continuing to work on. Um, and again, I, I would say the, the flu manuscript that, that should be coming out soon, I think kind of points the way for, for how we might. Do okay. That. And hopefully you guys will send the full spike particles to Ralph as well to test. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That would be, that would yeah. be great because yeah, we, we, we want to be ready for COVID 23. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, let's see, we've got just a couple questions left. Um, did, it's a little off topic, but do you guys, um, from, from your work so far, have you stumbled across any insights into, um, the potential efficacy of the BCG tuberculosis vaccine? Um, I, I mean, it's kind of controversial whether it actually helps or not. Um, yeah, I, I've not been following that story in detail. Um, I think it's super interesting, but I, I, I just don't know. Me neither. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and then, uh, okay, we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave you with one uh, great question that's completely off topic. Um, but, uh, you know, from all your work on, uh, building protein, protein interactions, um, are, are you guys, uh, how good are you at designing, uh, inhibitors of protein, protein, uh, interactions to, for instance, uh, you know, prevent, uh, amyloidosis? Well, let's see it. Um, most of the protein designs we've been making have been, the, the protein binding proteins we've been making have been specifically to inhibit protein-protein interactions. Like I showed the example of the, the COVID RBD binders competing yeah. out ACE2 binding. So that's a protein-protein interaction. I think the problem, uh, it really depends on the interaction. Um, the problem with amyloid, of course, is that we don't really know what the structure is that we're targeting. Um, so- uh, Sort of, we, we have a good guess at least. Yeah, well, if you maybe you have better information than I do, but <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I would say that um, if we have a crystal structure of the target at this point, yeah. we're pretty good at making pretty high affinity binders. And so, if what you're trying to compete out is a moderate affinity affinity protein protein traction, say ten nanomolar or worse, I think there's a good chance we can do that in general. If it's a if it's an ordered target, and we really you know because it's basically just lock and key kind of things, so. That was truly amazing. Okay. Well, thanks, um, thanks for inviting us. And it, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Best of luck saving yeah. the world. Okay. All right. Bye. Uh, Thank you. Uh, all right. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.